Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to our event, Voices from the Homefront. Um, I'm Lisa Cohen, and I am the director of the DuPont Columbia Awards. And um, this evening, we're going to be joined by three journalists who have been um, attacked, harassed, arrested, arrested, or a combination of all three. Um, one of them may be a late ad because he's uh, filming on a boat somewhere in the Mediterranean, but um, hopefully he'll be able to join us for at least part of the evening. I'm the uh, director of the DuPont Columbia Awards, and um, I'm going to start off by just telling you a little bit about DuPont, uh, especially the fact that we're open for submissions. We are a journalism award, and uh, we honor outstanding audio and video journalism in the previous year, and we're open for submissions. And I would just invite you all to submit your best work if you are an audio or video journalist at www.dupont.org. And we're gonna put those links in the chat. Um, and I'm also a graduate school student in oral history. And so this event is co-sponsored by both DuPont, the journalism school, and the oral history master of arts program at Columbia University. And uh, for my project this year, I created a website that is still under construction called um, Voices from the Homefront. And I'm gonna put that link in the chat as well. But um, basically it's something that I thought was a great way to amplify the voice of the US Press Freedom Tracker, which is a, an, a, a group that has formed to, um, document and archive incidents of harassment and attack that are happening now in the United States, um, which at, at a level that is unprecedented. And so we're gonna be talking about that tonight. Um, I wanted to just start off by doing a brief land acknowledgement. And um, I know people are joining us from everywhere around the country, but I am doing this and Columbia University is uh, on Lenape land. So that is where I'm gonna acknowledge uh, the land on which I am conducting this event is part of the ancient homeland and traditional territory of the Lenape people. We pay respect to the Lenape people's past, present and future and their continuing presence in the homeland and throughout the Lenape diaspora. Um, I'm gonna start by just giving you a brief video, since we are an audio and video entity, a brief video package that will help you to understand a little bit about our guests, um, the incidents that they went through over the last year. And it's pretty much a one year anniversary this week. Um, it's about two and a half minutes long. And I'm going to include in it, uh, Ed O, who is not with us tonight and may join us for part of the time. Um, and that's what's gonna start the package. And I wanna just give you um, a little bit of a warning that it's, it's graphic in a couple of places, uh, especially the picture that starts the package because is what happened to Ed in Minneapolis when he was covering um, a protest. And just to give you a little context because we're going to talk about what actually happened with the people who were involved, but the first couple of minutes of this video, it's, it is not voiced. Um, so you're going to hear, are you going to see what happened to Ed? And you're going to see it from the point of view of two cameras. Um, one is the local television station's footage, and then it'll dissolve back and forth to Ed's point of view because he was holding the second camera that you will see in this footage. And um, why don't we do that? And then we'll introduce our guests. <laughs> Uh -huh. What did you do, sir? I don't know. 
What did he do, sir? Please, sit down. Please leave him. Like, Des Moines Register. I'm with the Des Moines Register. Please just don't, just arrest me. Don't arrest him as well. And we went around the corner and I was saying, you know, I'm press, I'm press, I'm press. Police deliberately took me, uh, sprayed pepper, pepper spray on my face and then put me in a, put me in zip, zip ties? What are they called? Zip ties. Um, I'm in the back of a cop car right now. Um, I believe we haven't moved anywhere. I think, yeah, I think we're still in Merrill Hay parking lot. Wherever you'd want us, we will we will go. We are just getting out of your way when you're advancing through the intersection. So just let us know and we, and we got you. And uh, this is a scene here playing out in Minneapolis. This is part of the advanced police presence that we saw come over the course of, of really minutes when the local police showed up. We walked away. I'm sorry? You're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind oh, whoa, telling whoa, whoa, whoa. me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? Officer, he's under arrest right now. Okay. You are arresting him live on CNN. We do told you before that we are with CNN. If you're just tuning in, you are watching our correspondent, Omar Jimenez, being arrested by state police in Minnesota. We're not sure why our correspondent is being arrested. I'm just going to go around and introduce everybody, um, starting with Omar, who is the CNN national correspondent uh, based in Chicago. And um, he covered events in Minneapolis all through the last year and uh, most recently the Derek Chauvin case. And he had the unbelievable presence of mind when the camera swung to him right before uh, they told him that he was under arrest to continue reporting live on the air. And uh, I, I wanna hear a little bit more about that as we get to it. Um, Andrea Sahuri is a general assignment reporter for the Des Moines Register. And she's also, a, happy to say a 2019 J school grad. And one of the significant and singular things that happened in her case was that it actually went to trial nine months later. And so we're gonna hear a little bit more about what that was like for her. Um, and then um, we may meet Ed O or not, um, if he's able to join us for part of the time, but Ed is a freelance uh, videographer who was working for NBC News and he was reporting on protests in Minneapolis last year when he was pepper sprayed, he was hit with some kind of projectile and had to go to the uh, hospital and had stitches and pepper sprayed as well. And um, he's a DuPont 2021 winner. And part of the reason that I got interested in this topic besides just my general interest as a, as a journalist is that um, when I interviewed him after he won the DuPont, he, he talked about doing this kind of coverage um, as someone who's been all over the world reporting and who, for him, this he's been in hotspots worldwide. He's been in the Maidan, he's been in um, Terror Square, he was in Haiti. And this kind of violence perpetrated against journalists for him was much worse because he felt like of all places in the United States, this wasn't supposed to happen. And so I think that's one of the things that has struck everybody uh, on this panel. And I'm going to hear from Kirsten McCudden, who is the managing editor of the uh, US Press Freedom Tracker. And, and this is an organization, as I mentioned earlier, that's been tracking incidents over the last several years, but certainly in the last year when I think it's been an exponentially um, higher number of these kinds of incidents. So um, Andrea, I'd like to start with you. And I just want to ask you to tell us a little bit about what happened to you. I know that um, people got to see and some people got to hear a little bit of the actuality, but can you just talk us through a little bit of, of uh, what happened to you a year ago? Yes. So I had been covering um, protests all weekend when I was arrested. It was a Sunday about a year ago, just a couple of days ago, actually. It was May 31st, 2020. So not even a week after George Floyd had, um, was killed and Minneapolis is pretty nearby and Iowa 
you know, Des Moines is just one of another Midwest West city that where a large population of black and brown communities really just felt angry and neglected. Um, and so they wanted to make their voices heard. And the response immediately from the get go was police in riot gear, even when things weren't violent or weren't going in, in bad directions. And I think that kind of escalated a lot of things. And so when I was pro covering a protest that Sunday, it was in a, a very busy intersection. Um, it's called Merle Hay Mall in Des Moines. And it was about 6.30 PM when I got there and there was about 100 or 200 um, people there with signs. So cars would pass by just holding up their signs. And, um, and immediately after, you know, police and riot gear came and they started deploying pepper spray heavier and, um, and tear gas heavier and heavier as the evening went on. And I was just running from tear gas um, when, when I was arrested. I was running away, I was running across the street away from the tear gas. I rounded a corner of a business and um, you know, I turned around to see what was going on behind me and immediately I see an officer charging at me. So my first thought was don't run away, just put your hands up and explain that you're oppressed, you're with the Des Moines Register. So that's what I did. And he actually took me, grabbed me, pepper sprayed me right in the face and said, that's not what I asked and just proceeded to arrest me and put me in the back of the police van and I went to jail. I was in jail for a couple hours, but thankfully I was released, I was cited out and then I went to trial like about so, 10, almost 10 months later, yeah. So one of the reasons that this case got a lot of attention besides the fact that at Columbia Journalism School we made a very big deal out of it is that you actually went live from the back of the police van. That was footage of you in that kind of red light Mm -hmm. reporting on uh, Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was important to me, you know, because as a journalist, one, I needed to get my account out there. They had just arrested a Des Moines registered journalist. And this is not a New York, it's not a Chicago. This is, you know, Des Moines, Iowa. So I was pretty, I was pretty shocked that not necessarily, I had heard about, you know, um, attacks against journalists, but I really didn't think it would happen in, in Iowa. So my mode was journalism from the beginning to the end. And I knew it was important to say, you know, talk, say my story, tell the public what happened. I was also a way to contact my editors because I knew it was a matter of time before they took my phone and realized that I was, you know, going live. So contacted everyone I needed to contact and they did take my phone, <laughs> but um, I was able to, you know, get that out there, and it was actually very important um, for trial. So, and um, you had not had a lot of experience. This was, was, am I right? This was your first job out of the J School. Yes. Um, at the time, I was a breaking news reporter, and yeah, I was. Um, I hadn't even been a journalist, a full-time journalist, I should say, for a year. I think it would have been a year in that August. So, it was my first job. Did they train you? Had you gotten any kind of training for this kind of situation? At, at the J school or the? Well, either actually. Well, J school, we talked about it more obviously, um, but not necessarily trained for a situation like this, but we had talked about the threats and how you need to take your safety seriously. And in Des Moines, of course, you know, the paper emphasized safety and risk assessment, but we weren't really prepared. We didn't have goggles what are they called? Um, gas masks, helmets, even press vests. I didn't even have a press badge at the time because I was so new and I, it just sounded kind of the small town. You don't necessarily need it. I never needed it. So I just, we just, I guess, neglected to print one out for me. And so we were not really prepared for something like this. I mean, nothing has happened like this in Des Moines for a very long time. So I would say we were a little unprepared, but. What were the charges against you? I was charged with failure to disperse and interference with official acts. And are there other, were there other press there that were also charged? Um, no, no other journalists were charged there, just me. I was the only one arrested and charged, um, despite me saying that I was a reporter, telling journalists, I mean, telling the police that I was pressed multiple times. When I say multiple, I mean at least a hundred times, <laughs> at least a hundred times. The video does not do it justice. <laughs> um, 
And again, he said, that's not what I asked. And at one point that wasn't caught on video, it's actually caught on body cam video later. He said, then don't come back. I was saying, I need help with my eyes, please. I'm a registered reporter. And he said, oh, that, then don't come back. So they, they were very, the police were very aware of that, of my status as a reporter, but it really didn't matter in that situation. And we'll get to court in a minute, but I just want to bring in Kirsten because can you give us a little bit of context here? What is um, What are the statistics like and how have they changed over the last year or so? Yeah, um, hi Lisa, thanks and hi everybody. Andrea, you, it's so amazing to um, hear your story, you know, because you were one in one year time at the Press Freedom Tracker. So Lisa gave uh, some lead in, the US Press Freedom Tracker documents press freedom violations across the US. And we've been doing this since 2017, but you're right that we have never seen anything like what we saw in about a one year time span. And that uh, we know George Floyd died on May 25th, May 26th protests began nationally, really concentrated in Minneapolis, uh, but nationally. And Andrea, you um, were arrested on May 31st. So within that first week, um, and I know we're going to talk to Omar, who was May 29th as well. So that first week, we saw more press freedom violations in seven days than the tracker's entire history combined. So put that in a little bit of perspective, but particularly arrests, you know, in 2019, we had documented nine arrests or detainments of journalists. Um, in 2020, more than 140. So from May 2020 wow. to May 2021, 153. Um, just an incredible, uh, and I joke that I wore out the word unprecedented like a week into it, but it's it, it went on. Um, so, you know, it's amazing to hear these stories because yeah, we can, it's 153 reporters or journalists were arrested or detained in one year's time. But it's individually, you know, it's true. It's these individual reporters who are out there doing their job. You know, Andrea's in Des Moines and she's like, we didn't think it would happen here. Right. Um, but it actually happened all across the U.S. And how typical is it that somebody uh, would be arrested, a journalist would be arrested and then they would go to trial? Very rare to go to trial. Most, um, I mean, as we know, you know, we followed Andrea's case so closely because um, it'd been several years since a journalist had been to trial. Um, same, char you know, same typical charges, failure to disperse. Um, we see that a lot. There were at least 16 failure to disperse last year. Um, in interference, there is um, almost 10 of those. There's at least seven interference. And sorry, guys, I'm always going to throw the numbers at you, but we can uh, back off too. But um, those, it kind of, it had been years since somebody, since a journalist had gone to trial for this. And similarly, she was immediately acquitted just, and, um, you know, we were, I was also watching and it took uh, just a few hours, right, Andrea, for the jury to come back and be like, she can go now. Um, but 10 months of your life. Yeah, I'm sure it takes its toll just waiting to find out what, what's going to happen. Um, let me bring in Omar. Um, because I, I would, I'm very sorry for folks who could not hear what was happening in the audio in that little clip, but now Omar is going to tell us exactly what happened. Yeah. So, um, Hey everyone, thanks for having me. So that Friday, um, May 29th, um, I'd been on the ground in Minneapolis reporting for the past few days. I mean, I cover the Midwest for CNN. So I was the first team to get deployed out to the story. I got the call the morning of the 26th. So the video had gone viral the night of the 25th, woke up to a call like, go to Minneapolis in more explicit terms. And so I get to Minneapolis, I'm um, covering all those days. And then the morning of the 29th, we're kind of, the, the mood had kind of shifted where there was always this anger there. But over the past two nights, was when the police precinct there had been lit on fire, where buildings around there had been lit on fire every night. And you felt this animosity really increasing every single night when the sun went down between protesters uh, and law enforcement. And so this morning on the 29th, we were out doing what we'd been doing the previous mornings, out in front of a building that had been blown out. That entire block looked like a war zone at that point. And we had been very mindful of the work that police were doing because uh i mean anybody that was there and saw the images can attest they were not playing around uh, when they were trying to clear out these streets so 
We just figured it'd be better to stay out of their way. And so that's what we did. And in that clip that was shown, what was so interesting about that is that was the second report we had done from that exact location that morning. We were in a previous spot, police came, they cleared everyone out, we got out of their way and they sort of formed a perimeter around the block. So we did a report at the edge of the perimeter. Then a few minutes later, they came back to us because honestly, the scene looked unbelievable. In that same spot, they, for whatever reason, decided to move on us. Someone, uh, a protester or someone came running around, they tackled that person, but now all of a sudden they're surrounding us. We don't know why. I'm in the middle of my report. An officer puts his arm or his hand on my arm. And I kind of have my press ID out because I'm like, I'm live on the air. I'm trying to focus on what I'm doing, but I don't really know exactly what's happening right here. And that's why you couldn't hear the audio. I continued to keep reporting because I was like, you know what? They're arresting someone right there. They're probably just holding me in place. Let me just focus on what I'm doing and it'll all be over soon. And then all of a sudden, the only words I ever heard from them at any point in that interaction was you're under arrest. No other words, no other, hey, why don't you step back? I don't, why don't you get out of the way? I was offering a million things because I've covered many protests. All right, we'll move out of your way. Do what you got to do. Look, there, there weren't even masses of people. It was just us, one TV crew standing there. So that's what happened that morning. And um, obviously that played out live on television. That broadcast was uh, every few hours. We have a national and international simulcast. So that was seen live from Tokyo to Melbourne to DC. Oh. And, so, um, and so the reaction was, was, was pretty quick. Um, and I thank my cameraman every time. He's my main person that I work with, Lionel Mendez, who kept the camera rolling throughout all of it even before his impending cuffing. And you got to see that scene, surreal scene play out uh, live. And I would recommend if anyone wants to see the whole thing, you can just Google Twitter on Twitter. You can find CNN did, you know, like a six or seven minute clip of the whole thing playing out because they lead you away and they sort of, they sort of position you behind a whole phalanx of, of, uh, law enforcement and then they come back for your crew so there's like this whole process that's involved where they arrest everybody you had a, a cameraman a producer your security person yeah and, and honestly that that part was the most confusing because you know if it truly was a the press needs to get out of here we were clearly all in one team the camera is pointing at me we're all wearing cnn credentials yet i I'm the only one that gets led away, gets the microphone taken out of my hand, trying to show the world what Minneapolis, or at least this portion of Minneapolis had become. And then I get led away from the cameras, basically my only set of insurance, kind of like Andrea going live, this was my insurance. People could see me in this moment and see that I was okay. And anything that they did to me would be documented. Well, now I'm getting led away Phalanx was, it was a good way to describe it because they open up and then this wall of officers closes and now all of a sudden you can't see me. And that was a moment for me where I was like, I have no idea what's about to happen now because they could really do anything and then it would be my word versus theirs until the end of time. But thankfully or not, they went back and, and, and got my, my teammates and we all, I will say, it did feel better to have all of us together um, so that we could be accountable to one another. And um, that felt a lot better than just being by ourselves. But that was a, a scary moment knowing that, all right, they purposefully isolated me from the eyeballs that were holding them accountable live in the moment. And by the way, this came after hours of me saying on the air that um, this, that block that we were on in the early morning hours was just burning there were no police crews, there were no fire crews, there was nothing. And I was publicly pointing that out. And then all of a sudden, a few hours later, police roll in and sweep us off the street, leading us to question, of course, we never have any proof. But the question that we were asking was, was someone watching that and saying, you know what, we don't like how we are being portrayed, let's get it out. Um, and so those were the questions we were left with. And we didn't know what was going to happen next now that we were being taken away from, again, our form of accountability in a live camera. And so did you ever find out what was going on? No. Did anyone ever explain it? 
Nope, no one ever explained it. The only explanation, the only semblance of an explanation um, we got came in two forms. One, I was being led away in the moment um, from, that, from that intersection to the police van. And I asked, I was trying to level with the officer, like saying, look, I don't know what happened. I know things are emotional, but we're gonna have crews here throughout the day, throughout as long as it takes. What happened? What do we need to do? What do I need to relay on? And he said, look, I don't know, man, I'm just following orders. So that was one. And then the other explanation came in their opportunity to make things right with their statement after it all happened to explain what happened. Instead, they put out a statement on Twitter saying, in the process of clearing the streets this morning, we inadvertently arrested three CNN journalists. Once we confirmed they were journalists, they were released, which is just not true because one, I had my ID up the whole time. I told them many times we're on live TV I'm relatively known. Google me. You have my ID. There were a million things you could have done in 15 minutes to be like, oh, all right. Yeah, this is Omar Jimenez, CNN. This is his crew. We had a million people you could call. And so that actually, when I look back, is the most important lesson I take away from this. If that camera wasn't rolling and you all couldn't see what happened for yourselves, it would have been my word versus that statement for the rest of time. And everyone would have said, ah, well, he was probably doing something. He was probably no, I was doing nothing. I was doing my constitutionally protected job on live TV for you all. And you saw how we were removed from that intersection. And so that's, that's part of the, the, the energy that was, that was uh, injected back into me after this moment. And part of why we wanted to get back out in the streets and start reporting again as quickly as possible. Right. Because people were witnessing what happened to you and that sort of underlines what kind of job you do, which is witness what happens to other people. That's right. And, 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 and more importantly, I mean, at, at, at the core of what happened to me, it was a microcosm of the larger George Floyd story. Where at the, at, the, at the core of the George Floyd story, this was about how an interaction between a member of the community and police went wrong and how police in the initial moments misrepresented what happened. And that's the story I'm trying to tell. That's the story I'm trying to relay to the American and, uh, and I mean, really a global audience at that point. And in some ways, there was no better way to show the impact of that story than to have it happen to me. I mean, it wasn't intentional, obviously, but to see it, I think, injected a level of attention and energy into a story that already had a lot of attention and energy to say, wait, 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 wait. what is happening right now in the United States? And I think inadvertently it became a very powerful storytelling tool um, that lent a lot of credibility to the work that I kept trying to tell in the George Floyd story. Because after it was over, I was in agreement with all of my executives, with all my bosses saying, look, this is insane, but we need to keep the focus on the story that you're there to cover. And I was like, totally agree. And I think there are ways that we can blend the two together to make people understand why this George Floyd story is so important based on what happened to me. And so, of course, that begs the question, which I know you've been asked several times. Um, I asked it when I interviewed you, but what part did, do you think race played in this? Yeah, I mean, in all honesty, I think the symbolism, symbolism of it was where race comes into play um, for the most part. Look, there's no way for me to prove and say, you know what, this guy, this officer had it out for me and came in and arrested me because I was black. That's, that's an easy argument to make, but it's a hard argument to prove. And so I think the more powerful symbol of when it comes to my race in this is that when you look at who I am, I went to Northwestern, I quote unquote, speak well, I am polished, I am a professional, I work at an elite media institution, all these things that supposedly are supposed to protect you from the police or uh, make you a little bit more amenable to society didn't protect me in that moment. And I think that is a lesson that talking to people and seeing the reaction is something that really sticks with people saying, it doesn't matter what you, what you bring to the table, what accomplishments you might have in the eyes of the police, you are viewed this way. So that was a lesson that I think was, that a lot of people took from that. Um, 
Another part of that is the fact that my uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Josh Campbell, um, he's a white reporter, very capable, very great reporter, um, was uh, across the block, basically on the other side of the uh, of the police perimeter, and he didn't have a camera crew with him. And he walked up to that police line. They asked for his credentials. He showed it to him, and that was it. Went on, went about his day. Meanwhile, I had a whole camera crew with me, with security and on live TV, and this happens. Um, and then the last, the last part of it in regards to, I, I think how race played into how this was analyzed is the fact that it goes back to what I was saying before, that a lot of times in communities that, that I've covered in Chicago and Baltimore and, and more, is you have these issues where police may have done something to a member of the community and people in the community, oftentimes black, unfortunately, are telling you this is what happened right. while police are saying, no, this is what happened. And right. a lot of times I think media tends to lean toward what the police say when I think this was an example of, well, we need to be listening more or giving more credence to what the community is saying. Because what if what happened to Omar is happening out in the community and there just wasn't a camera to capture it? Yeah, that makes total sense. Um... And I guess, Andrea, I would ask the same question uh, to you, because I know that that also got, has been raised in your case as well. Yeah, um, I think, sorry, someone's mowing the lawn. If it's loud, <laughs> if it's loud um, I think, I don't, like kind of what Omar said, I don't think in the, necessarily in the moment, the officer was like, oh, brown girl arrest, you know, I don't think it was kind of like that, but I think, you know, be, me being a woman of color, me being the only woman of color reporting that day um, really shaped how how the situation what played out, basically. Um, you know, obviously, once they knew, very were very well aware, I was a journalist, I mean, I was covering breaking news, I wrote about the police, <laughs> I have working relationships with the PIOs and whatnot. Um, once it was officially determined, okay, she's a journalist, you know, they didn't drop the charges. And um, after, even after I was acquitted, the, you know, the district attorney, the Polk County attorney was saying that I was part of the protests. And so that's kind of how they were trying to go. Wait, after, after you were acquitted, he was yeah continuing yeah. to make that claim? Well, he told media, yes, that I was part of the protest. And, you know, they tried to put evidence, you know, evidence, it wasn't evidence, but that would try to su suggest that maybe I'm biased. Um, so I think that they were trying to paint me as um, a biased, un, you know, non-objective activist if, rather than a journalist. And I don't think that they would have done that to a white male reporter. I think it's much easier for them to be like, no, of course she was part of the process. Of course she didn't listen to police. Of course she doesn't like, you know, she doesn't like police. We're gonna, you know, stick it to her, maybe stick it to the register. And, you know, we're gonna take her to trial. And so that's kind of how I personally think that race played a role in it. It happened so quickly. I mean, he was running around the corner. He must've been right following me and I was running away. And I didn't even realize that police were there. It just happened in seconds. Um, so I don't think it was kind of this, you know, like I said, targeting of people of color, but I think it could have been inherent, who knows, but definitely I think race did play a role in, in just how it was perceived, like, you know, how the case went on later on, so. Well, and also you were there with a, a colleague who was also yes, yes. A, another reporter. Friend. Yes, she was able, we both had the same identification, which wasn't like a lanyard, but we did have an identification card. She was able to show hers, I was not. Um, and she was able to leave. She was right next to me. She was telling them I was a journalist. Every every single person around me was saying she's a journalist. Actually, TV crew, a couple minutes after I was arrested, um, TV crew walked right beside me and caught me live, like wailing on the side of the street, saying, I'm a journalist, I'm a journalist, I'm Des Moines Register. And they're saying, she said, oh, look, Des Moines Register, because they know me. And, and, and this is, they're broadcasting this back yeah, to the this station. Is live. And then the, I think this is always the most ironic point is the prosecution actually used their footage, like the case, it's called, you know, local TV footage as evidence that I didn't disperse. So it just kind of shows you, like they literally use journalists, you know, journalism footage to say this journalist didn't disperse. 
neither did the camera crews, right? So um, it was just disturbing. So. So let me ask you about trial. It, it happened, there was nine months went by. And then did you think they were going to drop the case? I think in the beginning, yes. Maybe, you know, end of summer. I was like, okay, I'm holding out hope. Kind of by fall. Because I was supposed to have trial in December. But then it was moved because of coronavirus um, to March. So I thought, you know, I think by fall I was, no, you know, because it was supposed to be, my trial was supposed to be December. I was like, no way, right? Um, but then it got moved. I don't think I really held up, held out any hope after the fall. And you testified. Mm -hmm. um, did you think at some, I mean, did you know what the potential sentence might be? Or did you at, at, at any yes. point think, oh, I might go to jail over this? Yes, I don't. It's just, they're both simple misdemeanors. And that's something I'm really thankful for. A lot of people, you know, a lot of protesters that were arrested that I covered, you know, they were charged with felony rioting charges. And that's way more serious than what I went through. And at the end of the day, you know, it's not about me. I, you know, this, the main story is about all these protest, hundreds of protesters being arrested. Um, but I think the, I think if I remember correctly, it's either like a fine or a 30 day sentence in jail, but I, I just, I don't see the judge being that malicious and sending me to jail for 30 days. I think it would have probably been a fine, to be honest. Kirsten, can I ask you, what is the, what does the law say? What are journalists allowed to do that's different from what protesters are allowed to do and what are they not allowed to do? And I'm assuming it, it differs from state to state, but can you give us a sense of it? Yeah, that's it, is that it actually is dependent on the jurisdiction. Um, in most cases, uh, when there'll be uh, a curfew, for example, and but there is an exemption for media and media you know, um, usually knows when there's an exemption and we usually know when there's not an exemption and there are, advocacy groups fighting to make sure that there are exemptions for media, but it does happen. There are jurisdictions where they say, hey, look, curfew at nine o'clock tonight, media not exempted. And in that uh, way, you need to follow those. Um, in neither of these cases, in, well, in both of these cases, media were exempt. Um, and um, I'm not sure if at that point, if when Omar was arrested, if there had been an unlawful assembly declared. So, um, you know, there are, if if uh, law enforcement asks you to get on the sidewalk, um, there are news gathering rules that apply. Um, but what we've seen throughout this is that it's beyond that scope. It, it really is beyond the, um, when journalists have been detained or arrested, uh, they should have been exempt from failure to disperse or the curfew. Um, they have been on the sidewalk or you know, doing, what we would consider quote unquote normal news gathering activities. You know, I just wanna go back to Andrew for a minute because one of the things we talked about when you described the trial was the failure to disperse that you supposedly uh, violated was based on a, a truck that was driving around with a loudspeaker. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, there's so many, so many crazy things that happened during trial, but basically they, said that the dispersal order was at 6 a little after 6 30 i had gotten there like right before 6 30 so i had just gotten there and 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 their own footage that they showed you can see me off to the side not in the streets in the sidewalk honestly because we were required to live tweet so i'm kind of i'm on my phone tweeting or something um and you can people are yelling screaming and they had a, a police they're trying to say that this police vehicle had this sound system dispersal order saying disperse, but they played it over and over in trial and the state's witnesses couldn't even hear what the car was saying. And imagine being there on the scene, everyone's yelling, so many things are going on at once. I did not clearly did not remember even hearing that one. I was not even in the road. And what officers on the scene are actually yelling um, that you, you can hear very audible is get off the street keep the peace, get off the street. So they're not saying go home, disperse. They're saying keep the peace and get off the street. And so that was our argument. You know, they didn't hear it. You, the media officers right next to them are saying, get off the street, keep the peace. I wasn't on the street. I'm keeping the peace. I'm just doing my job. 
and um, again, they used local TV footage. So, <laughs> like, uh, you know, like right next to me, you know, oh, this TV footage of you. And um, yeah, so that was kind of, and, and, and I was arrested like right before 8 p.m. So this dispersal order allegedly happened an hour and a half before. And I had been not even in the front lines of this, of the protest, I so to speak. I was in the parking lot of this mall when they were putting tear gas into the parking lot, which no one can leave, their cars are there. So um, they're throwing, so we're running from it um dispersing from the tear gas right and yeah i was running i really just looked back and there there the there the officers were and I, I i wanted to point out something that omar said that i thought was really important is um having the, the video as kind of your safeguard and also accountability um thankfully we had some video to this day we have no video of my arrest because the officer didn't have his body camera footage on we have from officers who approached the scene seconds after we have you know, the people who I was with having video of my arrest after I was arrested. And then we have KCCI footage, but not nothing, you know, no video of the actual arrest. And we have Verizon footage of me running around the corner, just as I said. So it's kind of what he said. It was really my word against the officers and the officer's report was a lie. I mean, I would say he lied on stand saying that I was standing there, wouldn't leave. It was clear I wouldn't leave. Uh, God, I think he said like the per the people I was with like were trying to pull me out. That didn't happen, you know. Just that didn't happen. The police account was extremely wrong and false, and there was no video to show. It was my, literally my word and the the witnesses around me word against these officers, and yeah, that's a, that's a problem. Um, actually, Omar, I wanted to ask you a little bit. I want to talk to both of you about this, but I want to ask you a little bit about what the response was at CNN when this went went on. Like both of your news organizations obviously found out immediately what was going on with you. I know, um, like as it was happening, um, what did they do? What what happened? And how long were you in custody? Well, so as you can imagine, CNN jumped into action uh, pretty quickly. Um, the I was only in custody for for uh, just about an hour and a half or so. Um, but the only reason it was that short was because, as I learned later on, once I was taken away from the cameras, you know, everybody, the top brass and whoever was was woken up and because um, this was at 5 a.m. local time in Minneapolis. Um, and everybody was on the phone trying to get in touch with the governor's office, the uh, state patrol, anybody. And uh, eventually they got hold of of governor of Governor Tim Walls uh, of Minnesota. And as I understand, it was his call to the state patrol to to get us out. And that whole process took about an hour and a half or so um, to get going if it happened immediately after um, we were taken away. And that was what it took. Otherwise, we probably would have spent a good portion uh, of the day uh, behind bars. Um, but literally, as we were being led in, someone came like running in saying, hey, are you guys the three CNN reporters? And they're like, yeah, they're like, and he said to the other guys, all right, let them go. They're good to go. Here's your stuff. And um, we were let out. And then the governor publicly apologized and even came up to me personally later on and, and apologized. Um, but yeah, that, that's what it took trying to get in touch with the governor at five o'clock in the morning. And uh, I think it also just underlines the idea that, you know, this was CNN. And if it had been a smaller organization, it might not have gone that way. And I think you told me that uh, somebody from CNN called your mother. Yeah, so um, your first point though is exactly correct that, I, I mean, I was very fortunate to be at an organization like CNN, but it makes you, wonder, you know, whether you're at a smaller organization or even freelancing, especially, you're not going to have the immediate army coming to to your uh, to your aid. So I was incredibly fortunate for that um, on on calling my mom. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, the night before, actually, my mom um, obviously had been seeing what had been going on in Minneapolis. She's in the Atlanta area. But busy week for her, she hadn't had a chance to watch. So she asked me, when are you going to be on next? I said, I'll be on 6 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow morning. You don't have to wake up, but that's when I'll start. But she woke up at 5.58 a.m. Eastern time and was sitting there live on her bed, half watching 
and then fully watching and then tearfully watching. And um, she was trying to call everybody at the organization. She was calling our CNN tip hotline, which is like some automated, I didn't even know we had that. Um, and uh, eventually um, our, our C, my CEO or our CEO, um, he called my mom sort of uh, tried to calm her down, um, but kind of gave her the rundown of what they were doing to try and get me out as quickly as possible. But um, yeah, she had a bit of a rough morning. And CNN, had they given you any kind of training before this? I mean, not that this was something you could train, this particular situation yeah. might not have been something you could train for, but in general? Um, protests in general, um, again, not so much this situation, you know, I, I do know the number to call, um, like our legal, our 24 hour legal hotline, if, if I get in a situation where I need to talk to lawyers or need a lawyer. Um, so we had training on that. And we, again, had general training and protests, but a lot of the training and protests was how to stay out of the way of protesters, like to uh, wear certain hats so that you don't get hit with a brick in the head. Um, it was less so the police are going to be the ones that are assaulting you. Um, or because the general rule was, all right, just kind of stay out of their way, document as close as you can, but the closer you get, the more at risk you are. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we were kind of flying by the seat of our pants. Um, I, I'm seeing questions in the chat. I'm going to try and get to as many of them as I can. I've already asked a couple of them, but I just was going to would encourage you to ask questions in the chat and we'll add those in as we see fit. Um, Andrea, how were you, uh, how did your station, how did the newspaper actually um, respond? Amazing. Uh, they were really, really supportive from the beginning. They called up a storm, you know, to authorities, the jail saying, this is our reporter, get her out of here. Um, that's probably why I was cited out instead of having to post bond or bail yeah and ever since yeah they had a lawyer come and pick me up i didn't know who he was so i was like oh i don't want to get in the car <laughs> with you but my editor <laughs> we were on the way so they hired a really outstanding legal team for me i think the usa today network um really did actually technically um because we're a part of the usa today network gannett um gannett Car corporation and so we just from the start to the finish, really supportive. Um, I was really thankful that they had my back through it all and that they allowed me to cover police and protests right after. I think the next protest I covered was just a few days after. And so, really? I, yeah, I, I, it was important for me to tell that story and to, you know, let, let police intimidate me and not let them dictate how I do my job and what job I should be doing. So mm -hmm. I, you know, really appreciated them being supportive. And I ended up covering majority of the protests throughout the summer and into early fall, so. Were there protocols that were put in place after your arrest that uh, changed the way you handled the situation? We ordered, <laughs> we ordered gas masks, goggles, helmets, vests. I never needed them again after that weekend. Um, all the other protests that summer were, um, except for one of them, but all the rest of them were peaceful, no drama, no violence. Hmm. And so we never really actually needed them, but I have them now. And it's kind of still, you know, the reporter's job to keep telling the story and we're not gonna change what we necessarily do. Of course, we have to still take our, our job seriously and our safety seriously, but I think we have more discussions about safety now and um, but, you know, we're just going to still do our jobs. So, Kirsten, do you have any kind of guidelines or any ad advising that you do from these organizations as to what they should counsel their reporters to do? Yeah. And Lisa, before we talk about that, I want to, if you don't mind, I want to touch on something that sure. both um, Amar and Andrea said about not expecting uh, the offense to come from law enforcement. And just to put that in a little bit of context for everybody, for 2020, more than 80% of the assaults that we tracked at the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker came from law, law enforcement. So we are able to 
uh, and on the site, you can filter by was it a private individual, unknown, or law enforcement. And more than 80% of just assaults were law enforcement in that one year, which is the highest we've ever had. Um, so I just want to put those that idea of being like, you didn't expect it from this side. You might've been trained to get out of the way of the protesters to, to respect that space, but not being prepared for that, um, that the numbers played out as well. And, uh, you know, Lisa, the US Press Freedom Tracker is part of Freedom of the Press Foundation and we specialize in digital security. So there are definitely trainings that FPF has for how to keep uh, your phone safe. Andrea talked about like, she knew somebody was gonna take her phone at some point. And we have trainings uh, for that you can read or that you can have live on how to, like what phone to bring and how to protect mm. it while you're out in the field. Um, but you know, we work with so many amazing partners, Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and everything from, if you have your equipment damaged, there are, um, people to help if you need mental health resources, which, you know, we can uh, even touch on more just how, you know, you said Ed had told you that at the beginning, just how it really changed his point of view. And we heard it time and again, how just, I mean, it was a long, long summer and you, you know, so many journalists were out there night after night. Um, so there are mental health resources. Right. Um, you can find all these in our sites, but also any of our partner sites, but I highly recommend them all the way down to Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Know that lawyer's number, um, you know, whether you want to write it on your arm. Uh, Reporters Committee is the legal hotline for journalists. So those are the resources I say always have in your back pocket. And if they go to your website or uh, if people go to your website, they would be directed to resources there? Of course, or just find me, um, FPF or USPFT. Those aren't the actual sites, but yes. So we'll put the we'll put the uh, website in the chat for people to find. Um, so I guess this is for everybody, but what is going on? <laughs> like, what do we what do we think is creating this incredible firestorm? Um, Kirsten. You know, uh, I get asked that a lot, the why, like, why did this happen? Um, you know, it's already 2021, uh, you guys, and it's already June, um, but we have to think back to 2020. Um, it was, you know, it was pandemic. We were in the, high, it was an incredibly tense time um, in the US. We were, there were lockdowns, a lot of, we were all working from home already um, for journalists and uh, people across the country were hurting. It was, um, you know, George Floyd was not the first black man to die that year, nor was he the last, uh, but why that one, it, you know, it remains to be seen except for putting it in that larger context of how everybody was hurting. Um, you know, it popped up in the chat. Another thing that we tracked at the tracker, um, was the were the negative tweets from our then president Donald Trump, uh, starting with when he declared his candidacy for president, through to the day when Twitter suspended his account permanently. So far, um, and we tracked that his you know when he calls out journalists, when he is happy when Ali Veshi was uh, assaulted uh, while covering protests, um, he repeated it and was you know said good. We tracked all of those and more than on average, more than once a day, our then president um, found a way to insult the press or you know, using the terms enemy of the people, fake news. We tracked it because we think that it, it mattered. Uh, we know journalists heard it time and again when they were out. Every time there was a rally or a campaign stop, we watched it as the tracker um, because journalists were assaulted at those kind of events. So. All of these things are happening at once at a very fraught you know, um, presidential election, pandemic, um, and yet another black man dying at the hands of, uh, of law enforcement all came together to set off an incredibly tense, continue to be incredibly tense year in the US. So um, in my interviews with the journalists that I talked to for the project that I did, which is, uh, it's a website called Voices from the homefront.org, uh, if you want to check it out. But there were people that I talked to, the two people who were with us tonight were both um, besieged by law enforcement. There were people that I talked to who were attacked and harassed by 
uh, the protesters at the Capitol on January 6th. And um, I guess I want to know, uh, Omar, for you, this have you had other experiences where you've seen this happen as a reporter? Um, you've been subject to, you know, what feels like a direct line from some of this rhetoric coming from on high? I mean, yeah, definitely. I've been at a Trump rally and they played a clip of my report as I've been standing there. Um, so I, I know for a fact that there is a direct line. Um, you know, it's part of why when you go to certain places, as proud as I am to work for CNN, it's just sometimes smart as a field crew to not wear CNN branding going out into certain locations, just because you don't want to draw extra attention uh, to yourself, literally because someone either has a beef with the mainstream media because they don't feel it represents their community, they might feel it uh, you know, it overblows things sometimes, which, you know, I can't say we're perfect there, but, um, or they may literally say you are fake news and we don't want you here. There's a place that that term came from and it didn't come from, um, from the ground up. So you definitely hear it, uh, when you're out there. Um, and, uh, in particular, uh, you know, at, in Minneapolis, for example, uh, at George Floyd square, um, Ironically, today is the day that the city started reclaiming um, right. that square. But over the course of this past year, it's really been closed off um, to, to uh, traffic. But you can go there and you can report there. Um, at least I've been able to throughout the entire year. And I've been on the ground in Minneapolis, maybe more than most national reporters out there. Um, but then a few times ago, I was shooting for the anniversary and uh, the gatekeepers there, so to speak, um, they're the ones that kind of traffic what comes in and out of the square community people they just didn't want us there they were like no no cnn no national media you guys have done enough get out of here and i was actually interviewing a state senator for minneapolis someone who was friends with philando castile we were interviewing him who literally turned the death of his friend into motivation to run for office so that he could change things from the inside someone who maybe was more welcome in that square than anybody else and we were both chased out, literally chased out, surrounded, saying, get the F out of here. And I mean, honestly, the, the conversations were very cordial. I was, I was, you know, talking to them as much as we could. But it was one of those things where that's totally a situation where I could have chosen to escalate and things could have gotten worse. It truly was because we were, you know, a mainstream media. It wasn't just CNN, just a national outlet. Um, and they, that community, that day decided we weren't welcome. And so as a reporter, you just have to go with what's happening on the ground. And I'm thankful that I have management. I have others that get that. The field crew's word is the final word in those types of situations, because you do run into those situations all the time. Whether it's presidential rhetoric, whether it's community rhetoric, whether it's police rhetoric, you're going to run into situations where you're not always the most welcome. Um. Andrea, I know that you talked a little bit when we when we did our interview about what you think can help to change that um, and what has to happen within communities in order for there to be more, less of a charged atmosphere. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is probably my favorite part of the job really is just being in those communities, thinking the good and the bad and being present, making yourself known, saying, hey, listen, I'm part of the community too, and I want to report for the community, not just about you. And I think just being present and developing these human interactions, I think a lot of times maybe journalists um, are a little bit hesitant sometimes, I think, uh, and you don't have to cross pr professional boundaries, but like I said, I think just being present and really focusing your coverage on about communities instead of for communities is just really is is really key and it shows in my reporting that's what i personally do in des moines and i hear all the time you're the only reporter that i know um you know i trust you i trust only you all the time i hear yeah. that yeah yeah all the time and that's because they see me around and they know me they've seen my they decide to read my work um and i think another thing i in, in terms of kind of like fake fake news or something getting out there that I, I think, I don't know if this is a solution, but sometimes I think subscriber only pieces or, or subscriber models 
um, can are a little bit scary because when you want people getting accurate information, we got to be realistic. Not everyone's going to have a subscription or pay for the news. And um, there's a lot of free free information out there and free and, and incorrect information out there. So that's something that I don't really have a solution for um, in terms of that. But we we need to make changes, I think. So. Well, and but I, you know, the thing is that making stuff up is a lot cheaper than actually going out and reporting facts. Yes, so. we gotta make we gotta make money as well. <laughs> so it's kind of this balance, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions that was in the chat was whether or not either of your encounters with law enforcement have impacted your view of the police. So, Andrea, what would you say about that? Are you you were a police reporter at one point? No. Yes. Yeah. When at the time that I was arrested, I was up until my trial actually and then after i was promoted but um yes and no i think i think in general i think that job changed my perspective of of police just because i interacted more with them and you could really see all sides of a situation and that's always just going to benefit your reporting um i I think that's all I can say to that at that moment. But all I could say was I was really just shocked. They knew I was a reporter. So they know me. It's a small town. The whole department knows me. So it was just kind of su surprising that that they'd go, let it go this far, but also mm. not surprising, I guess. But Omar, has it made a difference in the way you see things? Um. In, in overall in storytelling, yes. It, for police, not not too much. I mean, I, I started my career working as a local reporter in Baltimore for a while, um, and you can walk ten feet without veteran reporters telling you about the corruption in the police department from the '90s and about how officers used to give uh, people they picked up off the streets rough rides, as they called it, which what is what many theorize happened to Freddie Gray. Um, uh, all those years later. Um, and so those stories were there and not to mention the reputation of the wire and me asking, is that true? And they're like, oh, yeah, a lot of it <laughs> is true. Um, that said, you do work with police so much, um, especially in local news, you did see the, the good side of officers or the professional side or the, the valiant side uh, in some cases. And you realize firsthand the difficulty of the, of the job that they have. But tied to that, you realize the stakes of the job that they have. Um, and whether you learn that through attending and covering uh, the funeral of an officer who was shot in the line of duty, or whether you're covering the protests for a man, a black man in many cases, who was killed in the hands of a police officer, those stakes really set in. And then when you fast forward to what happened uh, in Minneapolis, to me, the George Floyd story and all of it, it was a reminder of those stakes, that the job that police officers have is so incredibly important to society when it goes wrong and when it goes wrong unchecked what happened to george floyd happens and thank god darnella frazier was there with her cell phone camera to film what the world eventually saw because if she didn't who knows what the story would have ended up and then on the flip side of that when you're at these protests or when i was at those protests in minneapolis part of the drive to get back out there after what had happened to me with police was that if I'm not out there, who's going to be out there? In my opinion, there was no one better to tell this story than me. And I felt the stakes of telling the story in the moment that we are in right now was, was never higher. The stakes had never been higher. And I wanted the opportunity to play at that. So you asked if it changed my perspective, not, not in a crazy amount. It reinforced what I knew there, but from a storytelling perspective, it reinforced the significance and the stakes we have uh, that we work in as reporters in getting these stories right for these communities. I want to pivot for a minute um, because this is a, this the genesis of this was an oral history project, and I want to ask both of you what being the subject of a story has been like for you and whether or not it has made you see the act of what you do professionally, interviewing other people, getting their stories, whether it's changed at all to be in the position that you have been in over the last year. 
Omar? Yeah, I mean, luckily or unluckily, I've had a lot of practice in this. You know, I played college basketball, and so there was a lot written about me there. And then, you know, when you work at a place like CNN, um, especially during the Trump administration, there's a lot written about you uh, then. Um, and so in some ways, I had these mini tests of what it was like to be the subject of a story um, and maybe reading things that you didn't really think were the most accurate or didn't represent things in the best light. And then, of course, with this story, the magnitude of, of what was written about me and what was and what people were saying about me, it was interesting to see because in some ways you understood how easy it was to misrepresent a story. Because while the vast majority of it was, you know, got the basics of the story right, a lot of people, you know, put their own personal projections onto what happened, spun what they felt my emotions were in that moment, even though I'd never spoken to them or, you know, never been a part of their coverage in any way, um, added what they felt CNN's role was in all of this, like just things that make you or are illuminating for the writer of that story or the teller of that story to be like, oh, that's why they included that. Um, and it makes you then when it turns over to you, it makes you realize like, oh, these stories as simple as they may be or whatever, it's easy to misrepresent. It's easy to, to mess up in more expletive terms, really held myself back there. Um, and, and that is why for, for our job, you need to get it right because you are going to be the record that people read to understand this story. And that's, I think, right. a reminder that that was given to me when I read stuff about myself. I will say though, great conspiracy videos about me on YouTube. Um, oh, really? Yeah, checking them out um, that I'm Illuminati, I'm devil worshiper, that I'm an actor, planned all this out. So recommend it, really great stuff. Really? Yeah, yeah, so. That must be very disconcerting. Um, yeah. Andrea, did it change your perspective at all or the way you might approach doing an interview with someone to have found yourself in the spotlight yourself? You know, I think in covering social justice and covering the protests, it changed. Um, just because I've experienced, I think, I, of course, you interview people and he, he listened to what they experienced being arrested and the false narratives from police and whatnot, but actually experiencing it is just always a whole new level of understanding. And that always brings up new and fresh questions and different perspectives. Um, it's also motivated me, you know, to continue reporting and really just not back down. And um, it, it, it was a reminder of how important this work is, is and how important it is to go in your communities and ask and highlight the struggles that people in your community are facing, especially when it comes to you know protest arrests. Uh, I was very uncomfortable, I think, with coverage about me. I am a newspaper. Why? I'm a newspaper writer, so I don't really do well speaking to the public or you know being behind a camera or just really being the center of attention like that. So, and I, and I also wanted the story to be about the injustices to the community. Even though I am, yes, a part of this community, I, I think my biggest hope with coverage about me was that it would shed light. It would be a lens to shed more light into what was happening during the protests and mm -hmm. other people, other protesters, and, and not even protests, sometimes just bystanders walking, walking along and getting arrested for honestly no reason. So um, that was kind of my hope. Uh, just, just a new eye, fresh eye, fresh perspectives, deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. I I um I want to ask Kirsten about this, but I'd be interested to hear what the two what Omar and Andrea have to say as well, because it does raise all of this does raise the question of what actually a journalist what makes a journalist who gets to be defined as a journalist, and I I imagine Kirsten that there's criteria in your in your work that determines that. Um, obviously, Andrea and Omar work for accredited news organizations. Um, but how does it work? Like, does someone have to prove something to you before you accept their information? You know, we are a press freedom group and every single organization will define it differently. Everybody defines it differently for themselves. Um, you know, I matriculated also from 
J schools and, you know, was card carrying journalist, but it is the tracker keeps a purposefully wide definition uh, because we think that it actually serves the first amendment even better. Um, you know, not everybody walks around with a landlord and, and has a huge entity behind them. And what we look for specifically at the tracker is do they self-identify um, as a journalist? And we respect if sometimes they're not out there wearing press. We ask the question, you know, how did you identify? Uh, you know, was it verbally? Was it, um, were you wearing something? And some people say, no, I didn't want to wear something. And, you know, but when I was, um, but I, you know, was carrying a large camera and they know me or, uh, but we try to have a conversation with every journalist uh, to the best of our ability that we uh, document in the tracker. And it's, do you self-identify, um, do you have a history, some track record of documentation um, and are you there to document? So protests, especially, um, I remember, you know, I was, I'm sure DMing a journalist saying, hey, we saw, I saw that you were assaulted. Uh, do you wanna talk about it? And he was like, oh, I was out there in personal capacity that night. And you have that right as a human being to, I say, even be out there Tuesday as a human um, who disagrees with what's happening in your community and Friday be out there reporting. And that might even be too broad for some people, um, but that it is how you are identifying and what you are doing at the time for us that the press freedom violation happens, the assault, the arrest, the equipment damage or, or more. So if someone is marching in a protest and yelling slogans, um, they get assaulted, but they work professionally as a journalist or they are in some capacity as a journalist, are, is that incident count as an assault against a press, as a member of the press? If they were not there in a journalistic capacity, we wouldn't document it. I see. And what about, um, you know, the right wing shock jock who has like a, 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 a Facebook live thing and he goes to a protest and is, you know, sort of feeding all kinds of misinformation to his audience while he's there and possibly even um, antagonizing protesters. Does, does that happen? Do you get people sure. like that approaching you? Uh, there are social media journalists. There are, you know, all uh, kinds. There are people that we document that might not, I might not personally agree with how they are representing um, a an event, for example, uh, but they do have a right to be there. So for us, it's about protecting the First Amendment uh, really means having a wide swath of who can document. Um, I don't see it as my job to anoint who is who may be a journalist and may document and uh, disseminate information and who may not. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one of the things, and I think we're probably gonna wrap it up uh, pretty soon, but one of the sort of takeaway moments at, towards the end of any one of these kinds of events, because we are a journalism school, is the kinds of um, advice that all three of you might offer to a young journalist um, that is making their way out in the world in this kind of environment. So I'll start with you, Kirsten, if you wanna just, if there's something that you would offer up. Yeah, um, you know, I still find every time I hear the story, I um, can hear them so many times and never tire because I went through journalism school twice. I'm undergrad and grad and com law twice. Um, but it didn't go into practice for me until maybe two decades into my, uh, into my career. So I think any, if, if you're watching this right now, you're already ahead of the game because you know that these rights are you know, guaranteed and enshrined, but that sometimes they, um, that they might be tested. And so I think if, uh, whether you're a student or a working journalist, um, knowing your rights is probably, you know, you might have known them, but now you can think about how you would actually put them into practice, uh, who you would call, uh, because it does happen to your colleagues. That's good advice. And some of that information is available through your website and the other people that are affiliated with your organizations, yeah? Um, Andrea, what kind of advice would you offer to somebody who is a couple of years, just a couple of years behind you, perhaps? Yes. Um... I have three quick points. <laughs> um, I think the first would be kind of what I was saying earlier is 
building trust in your community means being present and listening and taking the time to really get to know people and, and people in your community and, and listen to their stories and take, you know, being careful with their stories. And I think that's huge. That was, that's probably the biggest advice. And then second is to take safety seriously and risk assessment seriously, no matter where you are, it doesn't matter. You know, like I said earlier, I didn't think that this would happen to me in Des Moines. I knew of police attacks against journalists, but definitely did not think it would happen in Des Moines. It will happen everywhere. So take risk assessment very seriously, prepare yourself, but don't let this experience deter you from this job. If anything, it should show how important our role is in, in democracy. And I don't think, you know, powerful entities would try so hard to take me to trial or arrest all these journalists if our, the job that we were doing wasn't important. So just keep that in mind. And I think my That's third- That's a great point. Yes. I think my third advice would be, you know, don't be afraid to go into local news. <laughs> I love local news. And I know I had lived in New York for a year, so I get it. But there needs, there's a lot of stories and a lot of work that needs to be told in local news. So, um, and you learn a lot, you get a lot of on the ground reporting and front page, really powerful front page pieces and enterprise work. So um, keep that on your radar if you're looking for jobs. So. Well, that's a really good point that you make, especially since you made the other point about getting to know your communities, which is something that if you're a national reporter is not as easy to do. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of people get their news from local reporters. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just make a, a little plug for DuPont, which is that we have very strong commitment to local reporting. We honor that every year. It's, we know how important it is. So yeah, keep, keep fighting the fight. Um, Omar, what have, what have you got to offer? Yeah, well, I'll just throw a quick plug for local news too. Coming from me, I worked in Quincy, Illinois and in Baltimore. That is where I made some of my biggest strides, I would say. Still making strides, but that as a you know, 19, 21 year old was set me up, um, which was amazing. Um, my advice um, is something that I think has come into focus over the past few years for me is don't be afraid to lean into who you are as a person and as an individual. And by that, I don't mean you're spewing your opinion out on every piece you're doing. By that, I mean, you come from a certain set of experiences, backgrounds, hobbies, interests, use that to guide your curiosity. And don't be afraid to think, oh, they're not gonna like this or nobody's gonna care about this. Someone will care, at least pitch it. If you get shut down, you get shut down, but don't kill your curiosity because you feel like you need to fit into a certain mold of what it means to be a reporter. You lose out on you as an individual and you become mm -hmm. this blanket of, Ivy League grad or Southern people, or you need to be you. And that will take you the furthest. And I think that's come into focus even more so over the past few years. Wow, that's a great piece of advice. Um, someone has just put a question in the chat. So I feel that it would be nice if we could just get to it, which is how can young journalists persevere editorial takeover of their stories or silencing from inside their news institutions? Is that something that you could speak to, Omar? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the short answer is sometimes you have to play the game, change the game and mm. pick your battles. Um, in a perfect world, you'd fight every single story and be like, we need this word to be on this paper or otherwise I quit. You can draw that line. But what I've found to be most effective is you pick your battles where, you know what, fine, you go with what the editor says in this case and you you go home, you punch your pillow, you say, I hate everybody, this sucks. And then the next few times you come back and you find a story that's really important. And you know what? You fight for that story. You say, look, I played your game in these past four or five, but I believe this is really important to me. And this is how the story should run. This is how the community wants the story to run. And that's what I found to be most effective in the few times I've had to do that um, in, in my career. So you've done that. And it's worked for you. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm shooting 100 percent on that, uh, or 90 90 percent on that. Um, but only because I feel like I I've been good at sort of picking my moments, um, so that when they know I speak up, they know it's 
it's a big deal. They're like, oh, Omar saying something? All right, well, let's let's figure out because he's not usually one to complain or kick down the doors and say this is this is messed up. That's, that's really good advice. Um, so thank you all three of you for being here. And I, I'm sorry that we didn't get to hear from Ed O. And I hope that he's having some success out in the Mediterranean. Um, and I'd like to also thank uh, the Oral History Master of Arts program. And I would um, encourage you all to go take a look at their website, which we're going to also put into the chat, uh, oralhistory.columbia.edu. And you can um, check out their programs. And again, the website that I'm still in progress, but has interviews with Omar and a couple of the other people that I've talked to and still to come um, some of the other people is uh, www.voicesfromthehomefront.org. And um, just one last reminder that we, uh, we honor these kinds of stories. We honor audio and video at DuPont and we are open for submission and we would encourage you to submit your best work to DuPont.org. And I would like to thank everybody for joining us here tonight. It's been a really terrific conversation. Thank you very much. Good night.